story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes. Best of all king-size cigarettes brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a narcotics detail. You receive a call from a former suspect you arrested. He wants to meet with you. He claims he has information and contacts with a big narcotics ring. Your job? Check it out. Fatima, America's first largest selling blended cigarette. Now king size. See the difference. Taste the difference. Smoke the difference. And in Fatima, the difference is quality. Yes, you get all the advantages of extra length. Plus Fatima quality, which no other king size cigarette has. Fatima quality that gives you extra mildness. A much different, much better flavor and aroma. Definitely the best quality in its class. But the same price as the cigarette you're now smoking. So compare Fatima yourself today. When you see the difference, taste the difference, smoke the difference, you'll switch to Fatima. Because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack. Fatima, best of all king-size cigarettes. the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 9th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working a special detail out of narcotics division. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Captain Kearney. My name's Friday. It was 7.28 p.m. when I got to Lincoln Park, the west entrance. Yes, sir? Got a couple of bags of peanuts, please? Yeah, sure thing. Ten a bag, that'll be 20 cents. All right, thank you. No, thank you. Hi, Friday. Jack. Would have come over soon. I saw you walking around the park. Wanted to make sure you weren't tailed. Yeah, I made sure of that before I came in. Let's go over and sit down. Okay. Say, there's a lot of stuff just came in town. Some new pushers came with it. You know that? Yeah, I heard some talk. Like to knock them over? I got the contact. What's in it for you, Jack? A couple of reasons. Yeah? One thing I'd like to pay you back. I got out of jail last week. I talked to the wife. She told me what you've been doing for her and the kids while I've been up. A nice family, Jack. You let them down. And you didn't. I'm not going to forget it. Wife still has that job you got her. The kids' asthma is a lot better, too. Appreciate you finding that place in Tahunga for him. It sure helped. I'm glad to do it. Want some peanuts? Yeah, thanks. Now, what about this narco ring you mentioned? Remember Snuffy Breen? Yeah. He busted him the same time he did me. He got a year. Yeah. Just before I got out of county last week, he'd tell me to go see a guy get me a job. What kind of a job? Same kind you busted me on before. Pushing the stuff. What's the guy's name? Cadillac Red. Hmm? Yeah. New York, I think. Likes to drive big cars. I guess that's how he got the name. Hmm. What's the story on him? Red's been in town a month. Four or five guys with him, off in the east. Red says they got a big one to unload, six kilos. Heroin? Mm-hmm. Mexican stuff. They seem to be having trouble. What do you mean? Finding pushers, setting up a deal. The only contact they had out here was Snuffy. He's in the can and they're shouting around. How about the one peanuts, Jack? Yeah. You talked to this red, did you? Mm-hmm. What's he asking from you? Like I said, he wants me to start pushing stuff for him. He need contacts bad. I let him hang. I didn't say one way or the other. He's going to pull me tonight. Not so? Well, you figure you'll tell him. Depends on you, Friday. I know one thing. I'm not going to start pushing the junk again. You get around it, you handle it, you start to chippy with it. Before you know it, you're hooked yourself. You figure what you want to do, I'll help all I can. I owe you that much. You pretty sure the gang needs contacts? Hungry for him. Sitting on 20 ounces of junk. Can't find anyone to trust to push it to. They got problems. Yeah. Think you could give me an office to him? Pass me off as a buyer? Friend of yours, maybe? Good chance. How do you want to do it? Well, let him know you have a friend who's ready for a buy. Tell him I'm from up north. Make it Fresno. Red Mountain neighborhoods, all right? Okay, sounds good. Well, this man, Cadillac Red, 
He's going to phone you tonight, is that right? Mm-hmm. I'll call you as soon as I hear from him. All right, fine. Don't call me at the office. Now, here. Here's my home phone. Don't worry about it. It's a silent number. I can't trace it. Mm-hmm. When you call there, if I'm not in, leave the message with my mother, okay? Your mother, okay. Pleasant 49321. Okay, I'll ring. How much do you know about this red? You impress you as a big operator? Middle size, I guess. He's out in New York. That's about all I know for sure. Same for the rest of the gang. It's supposed to be handling quality stuff real good. How good? Red claims it tests out 40%. I don't know what his asking price is. Where's this red staying? Did you find that out? No, he wouldn't tell me. He was at a hotel on West 7th, but he moved yesterday. Nervous guy doesn't settle long in one place. Guess he's got a right to be shaky. All of them have. How do you mean? He got all that dough in the white stuff. Close to 50 G's worth. Kill him if you knock him over. Grab the junk. We'll kill a lot more if we don't. Before I left our informant, Jack Wallace, we set up a plan for future contacts. In case of any emergency, I would not attempt to get in touch with him at his rooming house at 3rd and Olive Streets. Instead, I'd contact him at his work, the Joe Adonis Meat Market on West Temple, where he was employed as a butcher. Wallace also promised to try to get me a sample of the heroin from the narcotics ring. 10.50 p.m., I checked back in at the office and briefed Captain Kearney. Sounds a little fantastic, Joe. Six kilos. If it's true, it's a break a cop gets once in a lifetime. Well, that's the way Wallace tells it. I can't figure any reason why he'd lie to me. How about this front man, Red? You checked him out yet? Well, Ed's checking him through the moniker file now. He's a New York operator. That's all Wallace could tell me. You got any idea where the plant is? No, I don't. Wallace didn't even know where Red was living. Red's supposed to have a meet with him tonight. I gave him my home phone and told him not to contact the office. You got any court cases pending? No, but I got two I was going to file on tomorrow. You better give me the packages. I'll have Lou Walters assign them to somebody else. You and Jacob stay with us, gang. Put them to bed and get them up. All right. Wallace is going to try to get you a sample of the junk, huh? Yeah, he said he'd try. Captain? Joe? Oh, hi. Hi, Ed. You dig up anything? I don't know. Found one Cadillac Red. Could be our boy. You get a mug on him? No, all we have is correspondence from New York. There was a want on him back in 1945. Same thing, narcotics. Later that year, the want was canceled. He was picked up. No disposition. You want us to radiogram New York for a rundown on him? No, let's not stir it up. Starting tomorrow, you two stay away from here. Get yourselves fixed up in a hotel room downtown. Let me know where you're staying. Okay. Call me at 2 o'clock sharp in the afternoon. I'll make it a point to be here. Better call me on the inside line. All right, Skipper. Where do you think we ought to set up, Joe? Oh, I don't know. How about Pop Sherman's place down there on Hill Street? He'll cooperate. You know what that stuff did to his boy. Yeah. Okay. You want to check in tonight? No, my wife's going to scream her head off as it is. You better make it in the morning, huh? All right, we'll move. Mm. Narcotics, Kearney. Oh, yes, ma'am. Just a minute. From you, Joe. Okay, thank you. Friday talking. Oh, yeah, Ma. Mm-hmm. Did he say what time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. No, don't worry. I'll get a bike downtown, then I'll be home. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Bye. My mother, Wallace, just called my home, left a message for me. Yeah? He had to meet with Red. He's got the sample. At 7.30 the next morning, Ed Jacobs and I checked in at Pop Sherman's Hotel on South Hill Street and took adjoining rooms. We'd left all possible identification in our lockers at the office. At 9.30 a.m., technicians from our crime lab arrived and installed a bug in my room and set up the receiver next door in Ed's room. In the event any of the gang happened to come to my room, they'd be able to record the conversation. I registered as Paul Lindsay, San Diego, California. Ed registered as Ray Morrissey, Sacramento. At 11 a.m., I went alone to Adonis Meat Market, where our informant, Jack Wallace, handed me a dummy package, which I took back to the hotel. Inside the package, I found a sample of the narcotics along with a note from Wallace. He wrote that he'd arranged a meet with Red for that night. I was to pick up Wallace in front of the subway terminal building, the Hill Street side, at 9.30 p.m. I gave the sample of heroin to Ed, who took it to the crime lab, where Sergeant J. Allen ran a test on it. The sample tested out within 40%. For the drug market, it's considered good quality. At 9.20 that night, I left the hotel and walked five blocks north to the Hill Street entrance of the subway terminal building. Wallace was there waiting for me. He said we were to meet Red at a hotel on West 54th Street. 9.47 p.m. We got to the hotel, went to a room on the second floor. 
This one here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, who's this? It's Jack. Morning. Red, this is my friend I was telling you about. Yeah? Paul Lindsay. Paul, this is Red. Hi. Yeah, I hear you got some H to unload, huh? Hmm? What are you talking about? What is this, Jack? You give me a bum steer here? Relax, and it's all right. He's solid, Red. You can talk. No, he talks too fast and too much. I'm here to do business. If you're ready, I am. If you're not, say so. I haven't got the time to play cozy with you. Well, now, take it easy with you. Get along a lot better. Well, what do you want? Jack vouched for me. Isn't that enough for you? The guy who vouched for Jack's in the county jail. We haven't been able to talk to him. Where have you done business before? Well, I could ask you the same thing. Now, look, mister, we got one thing in common here. You got something to sell, maybe I want to buy it. If we can't get together, let's forget the whole thing right now. You're not the only pusher in town. This chair over there, why don't you sit down? I'll fix a couple of drinks. Jack can fix them. Let's find out if you and I can get together. All right. Same, Paul, bourbon and water? Yeah. Well, how about it? How much you got to sell? Take it easy, huh? There's no rush. We can talk better over a couple of drinks. Well, maybe you got the time, mister. I haven't. How much can you furnish me with? More than you can buy from the looks of you. Hey, Red, you got any lemons? Uh, no. No lemon twist in it, Paul. That all right? Yeah, that's all right. Make it light, will you? Now, this junk you got, what's it test? It's the best this town's seen in a long time. It's 50% or better. Well, who are you trying to con? My tester used your sample this afternoon. He says it won't go 40%. Okay. You know where you can get better? Paul? Here you are. Red. Thank right. you. How about it, Lindsay? Do we do business? Maybe. Oh, who's playing cozy now? Well, if I do go, it won't be for standard price. Your junk isn't worth it. It's 40%. I don't care what your tester says. An ounce will cost you 400 No, not to me it won't. I'm not paying out good money for milk sugar. I want a big buy and I want quality, but not at 400 an ounce. Yeah, maybe we can work something out. Why get excited? Because I don't like chicken operators. I don't like stalling around. Now, if you've got an offer, let's make it. Price is going to depend on a lot of things. How much merchandise are you going to want? 20 ounces. I got customers up north. Have to have it for them the 15th of the month. Up north where? San Francisco, Sacramento. That's funny. We checked on that. Yeah? Yeah, the hotel you're at. You're registered for San Diego. Yeah, good address. I've never been there. I heard some talk about you. You ever worked Fresno? Maybe. I take customers where I find them. Hmm. 20 ounces, huh? At the minimum? For your stuff, yeah. Now, what's the price? I think we might get together. It's a pretty good buy. Might work out a discount on it. How much? Uh, three and a quarter an ounce. I figure that's reasonable. Maybe you do. I don't. Two seventy-five. I can't go better. If I didn't need this stuff right now, I wouldn't offer that. I'll split the difference. Twenty ounces, three hundred an ounce. You can't do better than you know it. No, how about it? Three hundred an ounce. I'm not lining up for a soft touch. I want another sample when I move on. You'll get it. Now, what do you say? All right, you got a deal. Twenty ounces. When do I get this stuff? We'll get in touch with you tomorrow. Who Jack here? Six thousand. You sure you got the money? I got it. Now, what's the setup? Tomorrow, you'll get the word. All right. If I don't hear by 4 p.m., I'll know you're gone hinky. I'll look up somebody else. You hear? How about it, Jack? You ready to go? Yeah, okay. See you later, Red. Jack? Yeah? You got a wife and a couple of kids. Mm-hmm. That's right. How are they, Jack? Okay, fine. Why? Nothing. I'll talk to you later, Jack. 10.40 p.m. The informant, Jack Wallace, and I took a cab back downtown, and I dropped him off. I got to a pay telephone, called Captain Kearney and my partner, Ed Jacobs, and we set up a meeting. 11.20 p.m. The three of us met on a side street out in the North Wilshire District, and I briefed them on what had happened. In order to prevent any possible harm to either Wallace or his family, the captain told me he'd have them placed under 24-hour surveillance. His children would be kept under observation going and coming from school. The next morning, I stayed close to my hotel room waiting for a contact from either Red or another member of the gang. 1.05 p.m. Hello. Lindsay, this is Red. Yeah. That talk we had last night, you still interested? Well, yeah, aren't you? Well, be out on Mission Road, 11.30 tonight, the west end of the park out there. You'll get your sample. Mission Road. All right. You gonna be there? No. Well, how I know your man, he might make a mistake. He won't make a mistake. He knows you. I hung up the phone and checked with Ed Jacobs next door to see if he'd picked up the conversation on his receiver. He told me he'd notify Captain Kearney of the plan for that night and that the captain would be in the office if I wanted to contact him on the inside line. As soon as I picked up the sample of heroin, 
I was to return to my hotel room, and Ed would immediately take it back to the crime lab for analysis. 1.30 p.m. I left the hotel, went downtown to a pay phone, called home, and talked to my mother. She said there hadn't been any phone calls. I walked around for a couple of hours, went to a late afternoon show, and then I went over to Frank Tang's place for dinner. 11.15 p.m. I caught a yellow streetcar going north on Main Street and rode to the end of the line on Mission Road. It was about 300 yards from there to the designated meeting place, the west end of the park. The place was dark, completely deserted. 11.25 p.m. 11.30. Lindsay? Yeah. Package you want? Eucalyptus tree back there in the middle of the park. Where? Straight back there. You can't miss it. You'll find the package under a rock at the bottom of the tree. See you later. I started to cross the park. The eucalyptus tree pointed out was about 200 feet from the edge of the road. There was a narrow path hemmed with shrubbery leading up to the base of the tree. There was a large rock beside it. I bent down and looked under the rock. There was nothing there. I started to turn, but it was too late. All right, wise guy. Give him the boot stand. Give it to him. Shake his pocket stand. No identification on him. He's clean. Let's go. He's got his sample. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Fatima, America's first largest selling blended cigarette. Now king size. See the difference. Taste the difference. Smoke the difference. And in Fatima, the difference is quality. Yes, you get all the advantages of extra length, plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. You see, Fatima contains the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos, superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Fatima, definitely the best quality in its class. But the same price as the cigarette you are now smoking. No wonder more smokers now insist on king-size Fatima than ever before. Friends, try Fatima. Buy several packs. Compare them. We're convinced you'll start the new year with Fatima. Yes, when you see the difference, taste the difference, smoke the difference, you'll switch to Fatima. Because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Buy Fatima. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. When I came to, it was a few minutes past midnight. The bruises on my face and head were beginning to swell. I felt dazed, sick to my stomach. I made my way out of the park and down the road to a public phone booth where I called my partner, Ed Jacobs. He came out right away and drove me back to the hotel. Ed put in a call to Captain Kearney, and he made arrangements to have a doctor sent over to examine me. He treated me for numerous cuts and bruises about the face and head and the upper part of the body. There were no serious injuries. At ten minutes past one, Captain Kearney called back and wanted to know if Ed and I could meet him at his home. He didn't want to take the chance of being seen around our hotel. Ed and I drove out to his house in the Silver Lake District. Come on in. Sit down. Yeah, thanks, Skipper. How do you feel, Joe? Well, my side hurts a little. Fair, I guess. Yeah, they really gave you a working over. Did you recognize any of them? Yeah, one guy. I don't know his name, though. What do you think, Skipper? Round up the whole bunch of them? No, that's not going to help any. Suppose we pick them up now. What do we got on them? A misdemeanor, battery, 30 days in jail, they're out again. We're right back where we started. What do you figure's wrong, Joe? Think they got hinky? I don't know. I can't figure it. I think you better take a couple of days off, go home and rest up, let some of those bruises heal. The whole thing could be blown by that time. The deal will be cold. If we're going to make it pay, i got to stay on it. How do you know they haven't made you for a cop? The deal might be cold right now. Yeah, it's possible. What other reason would they have for tamping you? How about your friend Jack Wallace? He might have a straight story. Ask him about it. No, I'll do better. I'll ask Red. Captain Kearney finally agreed to go on with the plan with the understanding that Ed Jacobs and another man from our office would have me under surveillance at all times. It was understood that I'd go back to Red's hotel room to see if I could pick up the loose ends. Jacobs and another officer would follow me to the hotel and remain within calling distance. 
2.10 a.m. I got to the hotel on West 5th Street and went up to the second floor to Red's room. Yeah, who's there? Lindsay. How you doing, Lindsay? You lousy punk. Hey, lay off, huh? I ought to break your back. Wait a minute, Lindsay. Wait a minute. What's this all about? You want to know? You set your hoods on me. Look at my face. I don't know what you're talking about. I went back to pick up the sample. This is what happens. How big do you punks think you are? All right, Stan. What happened out there? Not much. You said he was acting smart. We thought he'd cool him off a little. I told you to keep an eye on him. That's all. Not to rough him up. Oh, he's a cry baby. We hardly touched oh, him. Oh, shut up. Every time you get on that H, you get muscle happy. I've warned you before, Stan. Now, this is the last time. You better quit chipping with that junk. You cause me more trouble like this and you're out, understand? He's a crybaby, Red. We didn't hurt I him. I heard enough from you. Now go on, take a walk. Okay. If you see Max, tell him I want him. Yeah, all right. Sorry, Lindsay. These things happen sometimes. Can't be helped. Well, why do you keep punks like that around? I thought you were too smart to connect with users. They could get both of us in trouble. Oh, they'll be all right. Relax. Every once in a while, I get geed up and I have to straighten them out. I wouldn't trust them with my laundry. They're all right for what I use them for. The good errand boys. Can I get you a drink? No. All right, what about the stuff? You ready to move on the deal? I've been ready. I told you I needed the stuff for the 15th. How about tomorrow night? What's the matter with right now? Oh, no, you know better than that. I don't keep the plan around here. I'll call you at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. I still haven't got the sample. You don't need one. It's as good as the first one you got. Come on, what are you stalling for? I'm getting tired of this sample yak. If you don't want to buy, say so. You'll bring it to my hotel tomorrow night? No, I'll call you. I'll tell you where you can pick it up. 20 ounces, 300 an ounce, right? Yeah, no phony stuff. You keep your hands on the table, so will I. You deliver the merchandise, I'll pay the money. What are you worrying about? I trust you. Why can't you trust me? Yeah, sure, I did. Look at my face. 3.05 a.m. I left Red and went back downtown to my hotel room. A few minutes after I got in, I heard Ed Jacobs and Lieutenant Lou Walters enter the adjoining room. I checked the hallway first, and then I went next door and briefed him on what had happened with Red. I told him I'd let Ed know about the time and the place of the meet as soon as I heard. Waller said he'd keep enough men ready at the office to cover the area on short notice. I went back to my room, took a shower, and got some sleep. At 8 o'clock that night, I was in my room standing by the phone. I waited. No call. 8.30, 9 o'clock, 9.15, still no word. 9.25 p.m. Hello. Lindsay, this is Red. Sorry, I'm late. I couldn't get to the plan. Well, what's the pitch? It's all set. Norwich Grill, West 7th Street. When? 10.30 shot. Before he hung up, Red told me to meet one of his pushers in the last booth at the back end of the grill. He said I'd recognize him. The man would have the package of heroin wrapped in newspapers. I was to hand him $6,000 and he would give me the package. I immediately contacted Ed in the room next door and he notified the office. At 10.15 p.m., I left the hotel with a dummy package of money containing six marked bills. 10.28 p.m., I got to the Norwich Grill on West 7th Street. It was almost empty. I went to the rear booth where I found one of Red's pushers, Stan, drinking coffee. Right on the dot. Sit down, Lindsay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, let's not camp on this thing. You got the money? I've done business with you before. Where's the stuff? Didn't Red tell you where to be? Yeah. Wrapped up in that newspaper. He told me there'd be some stuff under a rock one time. It wasn't there. I want to look. What's the matter? Don't you trust me? You think I got a reason to? All right. Have a look. Yeah, are you satisfied? No. Open it. All right. It's all there. I saw it made up. That enough for you? Yeah. Okay. You just made a deal. Yeah, what do you have? Coffee, black, piece of apple pie. All right. You? Coffee. All right. Okay, stuff's there. Now, how about the loot? I got it. Let's have it. Six G's. Red wants me back in a hurry. Well, relax. We'll have some coffee. This is a big deal. Money. Now, how about it? All right. There you go. What's the matter with you? What are you shaking about? Nothing. I'm a little nervous. Red wouldn't let me have a fix before I left. Getting a little sick. I'm going to have a look here. Well, what are you doing? Red told me to tell you not to open it till you got it back to him. Who are you kidding, mister? All right, you go ahead and open it up. You'll have to answer for it, not me. Sure. Hey, hey what's the deal? Only a few bills in here, the rest of it's paper. Are you trying to beat us? It's already done. Well, you won't get away with us. We'll fix you up. Max is outside. 
Friday, we saw him take the envelope. You get the stuff? Yeah, right here. Guy waiting outside, Joe. We got him. They're taking him in now. Cops, lousy cops. Wheel right here's about this. He will. Ted? Yeah, I'll get him. Okay, let's go. Come on, fella, move. Well, what are you grabbing me for? I deliver the stuff, that's all. These big deals aren't mine. I'm small time. Fix once in a while, that's all I want. Just little fixes. The biggest deal I ever made. Yeah, sure. It's the truth. Now, what about Red? He's got a lot of this stuff left. This guy's above him. Big dealers. Why don't you get them? We'll get them. You'll never guess who the other two are. They're real high powers. Big deals. Nothing but big deals. You won't bust them a hundred years. Yeah, let's go. Get my coat, will you, Ed, please? Yeah, okay. Hey, you forgot your check. Who's going to pay for the coffee? Here you will. Who? This one. Me? Yeah. You just made a big deal. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 13th, the booking was made at the Los Angeles Police Department, Watt Substation, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that booking. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, last year, we were honored with thousands of letters from listeners all over the country. Letters telling us that you've bought Fatimas and you find them the best of all king-size cigarettes. Well, thanks to you and the many thousands of other smokers who have switched to Fatima. Now, if you haven't tried Fatimas yet, make this your cue for the new year. Next time, get yourself a pack of Fatimas. Compare them. See the difference. Taste the difference. Smoke the difference. And when you do, I'm convinced that you'll switch to Fatima. Because believe me, in Fatima, the difference is quality. The two suspects, Stanley Parrish and Max Higby, were booked at the Watts substation on suspicion, the narcotic act, felony. After a meeting in the district attorney's office, they expressed their desire to assist the police in the apprehension of the outstanding members of the gang. They were filed on, and before a magistrate in municipal court, they waived their right to a preliminary hearing to conceal the fact of their arrest. Next week, The Big Red, Part Two. Ladies and gentlemen... To build our strength against aggression, we must equip our armed forces with the weapons of war. At the same time, we must produce adequate supplies of civilian goods in order to keep prices down and defeat inflation. We can meet this double challenge by raising our productivity, by turning out more goods and services for every hour we work, and by refusing to let up until our nation is secure. Remember, the better we produce, the stronger we grow. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Heard tonight were Barney Phillips and Stacey Harris. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Every day during every one of your waking hours, NBC broadcasts the very finest in comedy, mystery, music, drama, news, and programs of public service. So always set your dial to NBC, the leader in radio programming. Counterspy fights international intrigue next on NBC. The story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a narcotics detail. You're in the middle of a drive to break up a $100,000 narcotics ring. You apprehend two of the lesser gang members. You still haven't reached the big operation. You still haven't found their store of heroin. Your job? Get them. 
Fatima, America's first, largest-selling blended cigarette. Now, king size. 1950. Fatima sales higher than ever before in Fatima history. 1951. Another record year. Fatima sales up and up. Why, in one month alone, Fatima sales were up 110% coast to coast. Friends, for your smoking in 1952, insist on Fatima. Enjoy Fatima quality. Extra mildness and superbly blended tobaccos. Remember, the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Yet Fatima's cost the same as the cigarettes you're now smoking. Compare them. When you see the difference, taste the difference, smoke the difference, you'll switch to Fatima. Because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Each king-size Fatima gives you a long, extra mild and soothing smoke with the added protection of Fatima quality. Buy Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment... Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Sunday, August 14th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working a special detail out of narcotics division. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Captain Kearney. My name's Friday. It was 1.23 a.m. when I got to 5th and Series, southwest corner. Hi, Joe. Ed, Captain, you been waiting long? Just got here. All right, chickens. Okay. Where'd you finally book in the two of them? 77th Division, substation watch. Harry here is willing to cooperate. Told us everything he knows about the gang. Well, I'm glad you feel that way, Stan. You won't regret it. Yeah. What's the matter? Hope it helps. If Red and the other guys find out about it, it's going to be rough. They're not going to find out from us. We're heading out for East Hollywood, Joe. Apartment house out there. Perry says that's where Red makes his pickups. What about does that stand? I don't know the address. I know the neighborhood, though. I'll recognize the place when I see it. How you feel now, Stan? Any better? No, lousy. Sure could use a fix about now. Sorry, Parrish. Can't help you there. How are you going to handle this thing, Captain? I mean, picking up Stan and Max Higby. You figure we can keep it quiet? The newspapers are going to cooperate. They're not going to print a word about it. I'm going to handle the court work. Stan and Max are going to waive their preliminary. That ought to give us five to six weeks of quiet if we need it. Can't reach the rest of the gang by then. We'll never reach them. Sure feel lousy. Sick. Never tried to kick the habit before. How long's it take? Well, it all depends. How bad are you hooked? Oh, not bad. I'm just chippy with it. Not more than a cap a day. Where are we going now, Stan? Keep going straight? Yeah, straight ahead. Turnout's not for a while yet. Well, how do you figure it from here on in, Captain? What do I do about Red? Well, you're going to have to con your way through... I had the crime lab fix up a dummy package for you on the seat there. Uh Uh-huh. Has the same wrappings as the one the real stuff came in. The package Stan gave you in the restaurant. You take it back to Red and scream your head off. Yeah. You tell him you got the package from Stan and Max and you paid him the six G's for it. You opened it up and found it full of powdered sugar. Read them off. Put it on big. You got a gun? No, I haven't. I checked it in my locker when I started on this thing. All right. Take mine. Okay. Make it heavy. Pretend you're going to gun them. What if it doesn't work, Skipper? That's taken care of, too. There'll be a couple of men down in the street, Joe. If you get your back to a wall, break the window, they'll come running. Okay, I'll give it a try. You think Red's still at his hotel, Stan? Sure. He's probably waiting for me and Max. Anybody with him, you think? No, I don't think so. All right. Ed, I wonder if you'd call my mother the first chance you get. She might be a little worried. Don't have to. She called the office before we left. Oh. I think I convinced her everything was all right. Oh, thanks a lot. Captain? That's it. We'll let you out at the next corner. Head back for the hotel. Right. Good luck, Joe. Right, Ed. Thanks. How about it, Parrish? Anything else you can give us that might help him? I don't know. It's going to take a lot of front. Only one way you can get that. Yeah. You better get yourself a good fix. I left Captain Kearney, Ed Jacobs, and the narcotics suspect, Stan Parrish, on the corner of Western and Wilshire and made my way to Red's Hotel on West 54th Street. I went up to the second floor and found his door open. 
I walked in. Red was sitting in an overstuffed chair next to the radio, listening to the police calls coming in. What's the matter now, Lindsay? Why the gun? Don't try any of your conning this time, you two-bit What's thief. the matter with you? Put the gun down. No, not before I get what's coming to me. You and your lousy punks. What are you talking about? Where's Stan and Max? Dead, I hope. That leaves only you to deal with. I should have known better the first time when you had me tamped. I should have gotten out right then. What's in your craw, guy? Come on, let's settle. Oh, you know what. Now, look for yourself. Six G's worth powdered sugar. You didn't think you could beat me for this, did you? I don't know what you're talking about. There's more in this than me. If you don't square up this thing with us, there's ways of taking care of you. I'm on the lamb anyway. Now, one more beef isn't going to make that Put much that difference. Put that gun down, will you? Now, let's talk it out. It doesn't make sense. If you've been beat, then so have I. Don't try to sell me that line. Get both of them out. I know they're here. Now, come on. Get them out here. Will you watch that gun, will you? I don't know what you're getting at, Lindsay. They're not here. Didn't you see them, Max and Stan? Sure, I saw them. That's why I'm here. I gave them the money, six yards of it. And that's what I got, powdered sugar. Now, you start explaining, smart guy. It's the truth. I don't know where they are. I gave Stan and Max 20 ounces to take to you. I told Stan to make the meet with you inside the restaurant. Max is supposed to be the lookout. Oh, yeah, sure. So help me. I, I don't get it. Two of them never tried anything like this before. Weren't you tipped off at all? Maybe the way they acted. Something they said. No, nothing. That moot Stan was a little unhappy. He said he wanted a fix and you wouldn't give it to him. That's right, I wouldn't. Well, then you should have known better. It's no time to get stingy with him when he's going to make a deal for you. Well, you know what happened the last time he took a fix before a job? I sent him out to that park to watch you. He ends up by tamping you. I'm leveling with you, Lindsay. I think we've both been taken. I still don't get it, though. I can't understand why they'd run out on me. Now, look, I haven't got the time to draw you pictures, mister. All I know is my dough's gone and you haven't delivered the stuff. Now, you get with it. Now, wait a minute. How do I know for sure? What? How do I know you didn't get the real merchandise and you took care of Max and Stan? How do I know you didn't build a frame? Oh, sure. That's why I'm back here. I got 20 ounces free and I want another 20. I met those mooches of yours and took care of them all by myself. Now, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, get off it, Red. You're not going to pour them off me out of this. I paid my six G's and I want the merchandise. Full 20 ounces and I want it right now. You're crazy. I can't do that. You have to give me time. We don't keep this stuff here. It isn't mine in the first place. What are you handing me? It isn't. I'm just a middleman, that's all. You'll have to give me time. Maybe we can work out something for you. You bet you're going to work out something for me. You got my six Gs. Why'd you try and big shot me in the first place? Oh, calm down, Mark. Trying to make me believe you were the big man. You ought to get wise to yourself, Red. Why should I deal with a middleman? I can probably buy the junk cheaper from your boss. Now, where's he? You couldn't buy it at two Gs an ounce. He wouldn't sell it to you. I handle all this stuff. I'm the only one he works through. What makes you so special? You can't even handle a 20-ounce deal and keep it straight. Now, stay cool, will you? Give me 24 hours. What am I supposed to be doing in the meantime? Same thing I'll be doing, worrying about getting that stuff back. Why try and cover up? Your mooch has ran out on you. Maybe. I want to make sure I'll get the word out. Yeah? I'll find out what happened. Before I left Red, we set up a meet for the following night in his hotel room at 7 p.m., then I left, went downtown to an all-night drugstore and put in calls to Captain Kearney and my partner, Ed Jacobs. I briefed him on what had happened with Red, and the captain set it up for the three of us to meet early that morning and plan the next move. The meeting point was down off Gallardo Street, alongside the Santa Fe train yards. Joe, over here. Hi, Ed. Captain? Hi. A little late. Anything happen? Well, I did some doubling back. I wanted to make sure I wasn't followed. Things worked out with Red, huh? No trouble? Well, not so far, no. I think he went for my story. He said he's going to do some checking around, though. Try to find out what happened to Stan and Max. Yeah, I halfway figured that. That story you told him, I thought if Red bought that, you'd be in. He didn't buy it that far. I guess it made an impression waving a gun at him, but he still has some doubts. What else can you do to get yourself in solid? You cried about it, everything, Joe. I've been kicking around an idea. It might work for you. I don't know. Yeah? Put on a phony shakedown for him. Might give you a chance to show him how tough you're supposed to be. What do you think? Well, maybe. Ought to help out if we stage it, right? When's your next meet with Red? Seven o'clock tonight, his hotel. Room 231, that it? Yeah, that's right. How do you want to work it? Oh, I'll get a couple of men from Metro Division, have them in uniform. We better have them work in a radio car. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to have a good reason for him breaking in on you. How about a 415, Skipper? Joe could go up to the room, pick an argument with Red, and make noise, a lot of loud talking. Yeah, that sounds okay. All right. Both of the men in the radio car will be thoroughly briefed. You'll know what to do Friday. You're out to sell yourself. Act as tough as you think you have to. All right, I'll give it a try. Play it up to the hilt. You give Red the least idea the shakedowns are phony and we're washed up. Yeah. Phone me at the office as soon as you can, the inside line. We'll be waiting for the call. Right. And just one more thing. Yeah? How about that apartment house Stan was going to show you last night? The place where Red's supposed to pick up the junk? He pointed the place out, all right. It's going to take some checking. What do you mean? Stan said he drove Red to this apartment house about a dozen times. Always had to stay in the car, though. Red went in alone. Didn't know which apartment Red went to. Well, can't we check him out, Captain? Got some men on it now. Going to take a little time. Big layout. All right. 47 apartments. I 
left Ed and Captain Kearney and caught a streetcar back to my hotel. I had some scrambled eggs, toast, and coffee in the grill next door, and then I went up to my room and got a couple hours sleep. Late that afternoon, I took in the show at a newsreel theater, had a bite to eat, and then headed out for Red's Hotel on West 54th Street. I got there a few minutes before 7. Red was waiting. Apparently, he'd failed to dig up any information on what had happened to his two operators, Stan and Max. I accused him again of trying to swindle me out of $6,000. I demanded the 20 ounces of heroin. Red had nothing to offer but apologies. All right, all right, relax. Will you take it easy? I'll work out something. Take it easy, nothing. You do enough of that for the both of us. You sit there and listen to that radio. Why don't you get out and hustle up those two mooches of yours and get my dough back? All right, all right. You don't have to scream. I said I'd work something out. All right, then start working. Get it. The dough or the white stuff. I gotta have it by the end of the week. What do you want to do? Have it all over the hotel? Keep it down, will you? Why? You take me for six G's and I'm supposed to play it nice? Now come off it, mister. I didn't take you for six G's. Those two mules did and you own them. Either you square this up or everybody in the business is going to know about this. It's got into you anyway. You've been boozing it up today. Don't you worry about me. I'll take care of my end. Real big operator, huh, Red? You had all the H. You handled everything. A real big shot, aren't you? All right, forget it. Red, the big wheel. He handles all kinds of deals. Fifty cents to five dollars. After that, they get too big for him. I said forget it, Lindsay. When this one gets around, they're going to laugh you right out of the business. You can go back to selling razor blades. And knock that radio off. I'm sick of hearing it. You got quiet down. You think you're ready to handle it, do you? I told you I'd try and work out something for you. Now, playing tough's going to get you nothing. You ought to know that. What's that? What's it sound like? Yeah, who is it? Police officers, open up. What is this? What do you got me? Shut up, will you? Take it easy. Can't tag us for anything. All right, open up. Well, I'm getting out of here. I'm not going through any shakedown. Out of your mind. Hold it. All right, I didn't mean to keep you waiting. Come on in, officers. What's all the noise about up here? Nothing. We're just having a friendly argument, that's all. Can I see your identification? Sure. You, stay put. Yeah. Harry, you better shake him down. Yeah, right. All right, back against the wall. Okay. Come on, hands behind your head. Keep them there. You bet. The lousy fuss. <laughs> Right, grab the other one. All right, good. Both of them. You crazy fool. Now what do we do? We don't have to worry about the other one. He's out cold. Take the gun off this one here. I'll get his handcuffs. Uh, Why'd you have to do it? Why'd you have to start something? I told you I can't afford a shakedown. You ought to know that. Better give it up, both of you. You're not going to get away with it. Shut up. You won't go far. Come on, Red. Help me drag him over here. What are you going to do? A fed post here. All right, get his wrists around here. That's it. I don't hold him. Lindsay, you're out of your mind. What do we do with him now? I'll worry about that. How's his partner? Oh, nothing doing. He's still out. All right, now, cop, let's have it. What's the idea of the shakedown? When we pick you up again, you'll get the idea. <laughs> Now, come on, let's have it. Why don't you lay off? That's not going to get us out of this. For a big dealer, you got a lot of chicken in you. Now, look, cop, give. Why the shakedown? You're wasting your time. Maybe I can change your mind. Lindsay, you're crazy. Put that gun away. Now, come on, cop, talk. Who gave you the tip-off? Put off? that gun away, will you? It's only going to get us in deeper. I want some answers. These fuzz didn't come along by accident. There had to be a tip-off. How do you know? You were talking up a storm in here, making a lot of noise. Somebody in the hotel could have complained. Come on, come on, get out of here. Leave the two of them behind to identify us? That ain't going to work. It's got to. What else can we do? We can kill him. You're out of your mind. I can kill him right now. You'll do it alone, Lindsay. I'm getting out. We still got business to do. I'm not looking for a murder. Now, come on, give it up. Let's get out of here. As soon as we leave, we're going to have to start running. I won't be good for more than a day in this town. What do I do about my deal? Come on, we can talk about it later. Come on, We can talk right now. You handed me the stall long enough. I got 24 hours left. I want it settled. Okay. Okay, I'll talk to the big man. I promise you. I want to have a meet with him. I don't know. Now, you listen. That six grand buy was a drop in the bucket. I want to buy more. If the big guy's ready, so am I. You got the money? I got it. Cash. Now, how about the meat? How about it, Red? Okay, okay. Okay, I'll set it up. Red got his things together, and we took the rear fire escape that led down to a service alley behind the hotel. Before the two of us separated, we agreed that Red would call me at my hotel at 10 o'clock the following morning. I wasn't altogether sure, but it seemed as though the act I'd put on at the phony shakedown had impressed Red quite a bit. Before I went back to my hotel, I called Ed Jacobs and Captain Kearney and briefed them on the developments. At 10 o'clock the next morning, I was waiting with a phone in my hotel room. At 10.15, Red called. I talked to the big man this morning. I told him what you wanted. Yeah? What's the answer? It's got to be a fast deal, cash and carry. Well, I'm ready. Is he? I think so. Took a lot of talking. All right. What about the meat? 
When? are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Fatima, America's first largest selling blended cigarette, now king size. See the difference, taste the difference, smoke the difference. And in Fatima, the difference is quality. Yes, you get all the advantages of extra length plus Fatima quality which no other king-size cigarette has. You see, Fatima contains the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos, superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Remember, the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality, yet Fatima's cost the same as the cigarette you're now smoking. Friends, compare Fatima yourself today. When you see the difference, taste the difference... Smoke the difference. You'll switch to Fatima. Because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Each king-size Fatima gives you a long, extra mild and soothing smoke with the added protection of Fatima quality. Buy Fatima. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Tuesday, August 16th, 10.33 a.m. As soon as I got word from Red about the meet he'd set up for me with the big man, I called Captain Kearney on the inside line and briefed him on the way things stood. He said he'd have three teams of men ready to tail me and cover the meet. They'd work alternately in three-way radio cars in order to reduce the risk of discovery to the minimum. He also told me the check of tenants was continuing at the East Hollywood apartment house where Red apparently was picking up his supply of heroin for distribution. So far, the detail of men assigned to the job had failed to uncover any definite leads. At eight minutes past eight o'clock that night, Red picked me up at my hotel, and together we drove out along Alhambra Avenue. We parked alongside the edge of a private golf course just north of the Ocean Highway. Smoke? Okay, thanks. Got a match? Yeah. Well, what about it? We've been here 15 minutes already. A lot of time. Deals like this, the boss doesn't like to hurry things. Yeah, well, maybe he ought to get with it. Relax, will you? So we waited. 9.30, 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11. Still no sign of the big man. 11.30, 11.45, no sign. What time you got, Lindsay? Uh, ten minutes to midnight. Have you got any ideas? Yeah, I guess I can tell you now. Well, you make this one real good, will you? It's been a long wait. Mm-hmm. Boss wants to make sure about you, that's all. He's checking his contacts where you said you operate up around Fresno, isn't that right? All right, so he's checking on me. What's he want, a blood sample? He's careful. He wants to make sure. If it didn't show, this is what he told me to tell you. Yeah? If you're cleared all around with his contacts, a meet's set for tomorrow afternoon. Where? I'll get to it. The deal's this. You said you wanted a big buy. The boss has got it. How much? Two kilos. Same good stuff you sampled. High-grade Mexican. You can get it at ten grand a kilo. Well, that's not bad if it's good quality. What's the breakdown? It's 40% good. You're getting a fat discount. You know that. Well, that depends. Two kilos, ten G's apiece, 20,000 bucks. You got it. Cash and carry. That's a lot of scratch to get together in a hurry. You got a whole day. No dough, no junk. All right, I'll get it. Where's the meat? Out by South Pasadena. They're holding a big flower show in the neighborhood. You'll meet him there. Contact me for the time. Yeah. When'll it be? When do I meet him? When you got the 20,000. 11.15 p.m. Red drove me back downtown and dropped me off at 4th and Main. Before we separated, he told me he'd call me early the following afternoon regarding the time of the meet with the big man, providing I had the $20,000 for the narcotics buy. 1 a.m., After stopping off at a cafeteria and then a coffee counter to make sure I wasn't being tailed, I got to a public telephone, put in a call to Captain Kearney. South Pasadena, a flower show sometime tomorrow afternoon, that right? Yeah, that's it, Captain. All right, we'll cover it all the way. Well, how about the money? What do you think? You got a little with you, haven't you? A little, yeah. Okay, fake it the best way you know how. We'll be around. As soon as you make sure the guy has the junk with him, pass the signal, we'll move in. Right. Something else. You get any lead at 
all on the big man tonight? No, nothing. How about you? Good piece of luck. I think we got him spotted. Before he hung up, Captain Kearney told me that the careful screening of tenants in the East Hollywood apartment house pointed out to them by Stan had netted a couple of prime suspects. They were an elderly couple, a Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Leslie. Besides the fact that he had a narcotics record in the East, Mr. Leslie operated a second-hand bookstore on Beverly Boulevard, which apparently was being visited often by known narcotics peddlers. Early the following afternoon, Red called me at my hotel room, and I told him I had the $20,000 for the buy. He picked me up at 1.45 p.m. I flashed a stack of money containing mostly $1 bills, and he seemed satisfied. He drove me out to the site of the flower show in South Pasadena, a large glass domed conservatory just off the Arroyo Seco Freeway. Let's head back this way, huh? Yeah. Sure nice flowers, huh? Just beautiful. How many times are you going to have to cover this route? I've seen everything twice already. Won't be long. A couple of minutes. Oh, this way. Come on. And they sure pray. Look, I don't get any of this. If we got business, why can't it be in private? Is this your big man's idea of a joke? It's protection, Lindsay. He's got to be careful. I guess he figures this is the last place they'd look for if we make another round of this place, we'll stand out like a sore thumb. Oh, relax. You'll make the buy. Coming up right now. What? Come on, follow me. Tom? What do you say? Oh, oh you're in. What do you think of my gladiola entries? Those up there. When you say the beauties? Yeah, yeah, they're real great, Tom. Took me three and a half years to get blooms like that. South African species, you know, the Chelsea type. Raised them right in a little greenhouse back of our place. Huh? You see, the scarlets and the whites, those are mine. Yeah. Oh, Tom, I'd like to have you meet that friend of mine. Lindsay, this is Tom. Hi. Right. How do you do? What do you think of my entries? Raised every one of them from seeds, Lindsay. They take a lot of care. Yeah, they're all right. Plenty of care. Especially those, the South African type. They take a good, stiff, sandy loam, quality fertilizer, just the right kind of heat and water. Takes a lot of work. Proud of them. Yeah. Look, I haven't got too much time to spend. Maybe we better talk outside, huh? Yes, that takes quite a lot of work. Beautiful blooms. You have all the money with you? All of it. You got two kilos? That's correct. You can go out the side way. In red. Hmm? You follow behind. Keep an eye open. Right, sir. This way. Sorry for the delay. It's necessary sometimes. Yeah. You came out with red. You double-checked. You went followed. I double-checked. I've been doing business longer in red. Hmm. Maybe we can make it a permanent tie. Out here. My car's this way. You always make deals in the open, public places? Not always. It has its advantages. You sure this is the H.I. sample? No, I don't want another phony buy. It's no phony. You can be sure of that. Here's a car. Well, the money. Well, you show me the stuff. Red knows I got the money. The red? Yeah, Tom. The money. You saw it before you brought him here? Yeah, he showed it to me. Right here in my pocket. Have a look if you want. Now, come on. I can't afford to camp on this thing. All right. Keep a lookout, Red. All right, sir. In the car, Lindsay. Yeah. Mm. There. Under the dashboard here. I always find that's the best place. You have a car, of course. I'll go back with Red. All right. There you are. Two kilos. Now the money. What about breaking the package? How do I know it's not more powdered sugar? Of course it's not. <laughs> Wait a minute. What is this? Those men coming up to the I'll car. Take it easy, mister. Well, I'm getting out of here. Let go. Come here. Let go. No. All right, Joe. We got him. Hold him, Ed. I'll shake him down. Hey, look out. We got the other one. Red. No trouble. Good. Okay, he's clean. Red. That stupid red. I should have known. I should have known. Joe, good work. 
Stuff all there? Yeah, two kilos. You want us to take him back in our car, Skipper? All right. We'll take in the other one. Meet you at the parking lot gate. We'll follow you in. Right. All right, mister. This way. Look, let me ask you a favor. Won't take a minute. Yeah? Let me call my wife. I want to let her know what's happened. I want her to come out here and get my flowers. I got some valuable plants on that show. I'll be taken care of. Your wife couldn't make it anyway. She was picked up an hour ago. No, couldn't be. What's going to happen? Every dollar I own, all my merchandise, two kilos, best quality, all of it. We'll take care of that. Come on, let's go. Oh, my God. Those beautiful plants. You can do that much for me. Let me go back and get my flowers. They're prized, Gladiola. It won't hurt anything, will it? Just let me take some with me. Just a few till I get back. Why bother? They won't last that long. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 4th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 84, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. When you compare Fatima, see the difference, taste the difference, and then smoke that difference, I'm convinced that you'll switch to Fatima, because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Now, to show our confidence in Fatima, we're making a money-back guarantee to every king-size cigarette smoker. Buy a pack of Fatimas. Enjoy Fatima quality, extra mildness, and superbly blended tobaccos. If you're not convinced Fatima is better than the king-size cigarette you're now smoking, just return the pack and the unsmoked Fatimas before April 1st, and we'll give you your money back, plus postage. That's Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Buy Fatima. Each king-size Fatima gives you a long, extra mild and soothing smoke with the added protection of Fatima quality. Thomas Leslie and William Red Forrester were filed on in the district attorney's office for violation of the State Health and Safety Code, Section 11,500. Both men were tried in Superior Court and found guilty of the charge. The violation carries a penalty of imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than five, nor more than ten years. Because of their cooperation in the investigation and apprehension of the narcotics gang ringleaders, Stan Parrish and Max Higby were given one-year sentences in the county jail with five years probation. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Heard tonight were Barney Phillips and Stacey Harris. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Next, it's David Harding and Counter Spy on NBC. The story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet on both radio and television. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide, special detail. There are rumors of an impending war between juvenile gangs in your city. Reportedly, members of both gangs are well supplied with homemade weapons. You don't know when the fighting will break out. You don't know where. Your job? Stop it. Fatima, America's first largest-selling blended cigarette, now king-size. See the difference, taste the difference, smoke the difference. And in Fatima, the difference is quality. See the difference. Fatimas are 21% longer. Taste the difference. Enjoy Fatima's extra mildness. Much different, much better flavor and aroma. Smoke the difference. Get all the advantages of extra length. 
plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Definitely the best quality in its class, but the same price as the cigarette you're now smoking. So why wait? Switch to Fatima today. Each king-size Fatima gives you a long, extra mild and soothing smoke with the added protection of Fatima quality. Buy Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, October 14th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working a special detail out of Homicide Division. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. It was 1.18 p.m. when I got to 2015 East 1st Street, the second floor. Hollenbeck Juvenile Division. Joe? Hi. What'd you find out? Nothing yet. Gardner had to go next door. He'll be back in a minute. Give us a rundown on the thing. Friday? Ed? Hi, Gardner. Hi, how you doing? Good to see you. How are things going downtown? Oh, not bad. A little slow. Here, you got problems. Lots of them. Captain Brief, you on any of it? No, he told us to check with you. You'd fill us in. Said maybe you could use some help. All we can get. We're sitting on top of a bomb out here. We don't know when it's going to go off. What's the pitch, Gardner? Juvenile gangs. Five of them this time. The way we get it, they're ready for trouble, all of them. High school kids? Most of them. Some of them are in junior high. Well, how come five gangs? What are they planning? A free-for-all? It's a long story. They've been building up to this thing for months, all east side kids. We hear it's supposed to be an open war. Mm Mm-hmm. Here's a list of the different gangs involved. Thanks. You can see there, same crowds we've been riding herd on for the last couple of years. Uh Uh-huh. We've got the Purple Heart Gang, the Blue Devils, the Apaches, Happy Valley, Rose Hill. Here's the breakdown on each one of them. Hard to get exact figures, but we think it's fairly accurate. Uh Uh-huh. Purple Heart Gang, 26 members. Leader Harold Fry, age 17. Blue Devils, 18 members. Leaders Jack Holland, age 17, and Bertram Willis, 16. The Apaches, 22 members. Leader Robert Lawson, 17. They're supposed to be the strongest bunch. Well. Happy Valley Gang, 20 members. Leaders Roy Martin, 16, and Joseph Gomez, 16. Rose Hill Gang, 16 members. Leader Thomas Resnick, 18. Yeah. Well, what's behind it, Gardner? I mean, the gang war that they're supposed to be planning. A lot of factors enter into it, I guess. It's my own idea. The Apache gang's doing most of the promoting. Well, see how, Dick, anyway. The usual big shot idea some high school kids get. The Apaches figure they're going to run the whole east side. They've already scared the Happy Valley gang and the Blue Devils into joining up with them. Well, how'd they manage that? I'd like to find out myself. Well, how about the other two crowds there, Rose Hill and the Purple Heart Bunch? The story I get is they won't come in with the Apaches. That's supposed to be the reason for the war. Either they join up with the Apaches or they fight them. That's the warning they got. Hmm. Pretty playing it big time, huh? All the way. 16, 17-year-olds. They got gang lieutenants. They got their own cars, their own hideouts. Some of them even have their girlfriends running with them. Same age. None of them over 17. Where'd you get your information, Bill? Half a dozen kids. Most of them from the Blue Devils and the Happy Valley Gang. They were mixed up in a couple of after-school fights in Hollenbeck Park. The stories they gave us are enough to curl your hair. Yeah, how do you mean? About the big war they're going to have. One of the girls we picked up gave us most of it. Fifteen-year-old. Says her boyfriend's one of the big shots for the Blue Devil. What she had to say? Talked about it like it was some kind of a game they were playing. Yeah. Said the Rose Hill and the Purple Heart gangs were teaming up so they could stand up against the other three. They've been getting ready for the war for six weeks. They're really organized. I don't get it. Who's doing the organizing? Who's promoting it? I got an idea about that. I'll get to it in a minute. Take a look at these over here. Yeah. Samples of the different weapons the gangs are getting together for the big fight. <laughs> Crazy kids. Brass knuckles. Homemade saps, all kinds. Well, what's this here, Gardner? Have a look. Homemade stiletto. Good six-inch blade. Kids are supposed to have dozens of them. Another one here. Look at this. Ice pick. Anything you can think of, you name it, we got it. It's going to be wholesale murder if we can't find a way to stop it. You been able to finger what the real trouble is, Bill? I got an idea, yeah. You asked about the gangs teaming up a minute ago. Yeah. We figure we got a young Hitler on our hands. A kid by the name of Robert Lawson. He's supposed to be the ringleader of the Apache gang. Moved in about a year ago from the Middle West. How much you know about him? Wrote a letter to the city he originally came from. Nothing but trouble back there. Bad juvenile record. 
We talked to the boy a couple of times. His parents, too, didn't do much good. Mm-hmm. Never had enough to file a petition on him and bring him to the attention of the juvenile court. We know he's responsible for a lot of the trouble we got, but he always has some other kid do it for him. Never does it himself. You think he's responsible for working up the gang war ideas, eh? We figure he's our biggest problem. We've tried everything to reach the Lawson kid and settle him down. Checked for the teachers at his school, the principal, vice principal. They can't handle him. They figure on expelling him if he doesn't straighten up. Well, how about the other youngsters in these gangs? I mean, besides this Lawson boy here. We've got notifications out for them and their parents. They're supposed to be in here tomorrow night, 7.30. Maybe we can break Lawson's hold on these kids. Sure got me. What's the matter with this Lawson boy's parents? Don't they know what's going on? Can't they control him? Well, we tried to talk to the parents. They think we're wrong. They're proud of the kid. He's got a high IQ. They think he's a natural-born leader. Oh, sure. Yeah. The mother says people just don't understand the boy. Or maybe you should have told him. Huh? San Quentin's full of people we don't understand. The following night, Wednesday, October 15th, the members and ringleaders of the various juvenile gangs, along with their parents, showed up at Hollenbeck Juvenile Division as requested. In questioning each of the youngsters, we definitely confirmed the reports we had of the impending gang war. The interviews also revealed that if and when the fighting did start, it would be more serious than we at first figured. For one thing, there were more youngsters involved than we thought. The gangs had been recruiting new members by the dozen in preparation for the street fights. For another thing, we found out the teenagers weren't carrying around eight-inch knives and brass knuckles just for show. If fighting started, they were ready and willing to use them. We weren't sure how much we could count on it, but after interviewing the parents and advising them how serious the situation was, they promised their full cooperation. Most of them agreed they'd maintain strict check on their youngsters and keep them out of all neighborhood gang activities. Some of the parents took a resentful attitude. They insisted the gangs were harmless. They accused us of picking on the youngsters. A few of the parents didn't even show up at the meeting. Among these were the parents of 17-year-old Robert Lawson, the boy who seemed to be promoting most of the trouble. The following morning, my partner Ed Jacobs and I drove out to his home and we talked with his mother. She was friendly, but not too cooperative. I don't know why you say that, Sergeant. I appreciate you worrying about my boy, but I'm sure it's not as bad as you think. I don't mean to contradict you, Mrs. Lawson, but I'm afraid it is a lot worse than you think. It's what the other officers said, too, but you really don't have any proof, do you? I mean, a few idle rumors. You certainly can't accuse Robert on that basis. We're not accusing Robert of anything, ma'am. That's not the point. What we're trying to do is to head off the trouble before it starts. You were living in the Middle West before you came to Los Angeles. Is that right, ma'am? Yes, that's right, Nebraska. Well, wasn't your boy in some kind of trouble back there? Yes, but it didn't amount to anything. Could have been avoided so easily. They just didn't understand Robert. That was the whole trouble. Is he an only child, ma'am? Yes, just Robert. But he's not spoiled. I know it's a great temptation with an only child, but we didn't spoil him. Robert just isn't like that. Uh Uh-huh. You allow him quite a bit of freedom, do you, ma'am? I mean, does he go out at night very often? Well, he is 17 years old, going on 18. Yes, my husband and I allow him to go out as often as he likes, as long as he keeps up with his studies. Robert's always done very well. Always tops in his class. Do you know where he spends his time when he goes out at night? He's usually down at the gym or at the library. You know that for a fact, do you? I trust Robert, if that's what you mean. If he tells me that's where he's going, I believe him. The mother can't believe her own son. Who can she believe? How about the company your boy keeps? You know any of his friends, Mrs. Lawson? Few, yes. There's the Miller boy and Jack Holland. They seem to be fine boys. Miller and Holland? Yes. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with them. Well, there is, ma'am. What? Both of them have juvenile records. Both of them belong to your son's gang. Really, Sergeant, how can you say that? It isn't fair. Wouldn't it be better to try and understand these boys instead of picking on them, persecuting them? I don't know how we're going to make you understand, Mrs. Lawson. We're not picking on them. We're not persecuting them. We know there's a gang problem. We know your boy's one of those at the bottom of it. If something isn't done, there's going to be trouble. If we're going to stop it before it begins, we're going to have to have your help. I'm perfectly willing to cooperate, you know that. That must be Robert now, excuse me. Robert! Bob, is that you? Yeah. Would you come in here a minute, Bob? We're in the living room. Yeah? What do you want? These are police officers, Bobby. This is Sergeant Friday. Sergeant Jacobs, is that right? Yes, ma'am. How are you? How do you do? Hi. How about something to eat? Haven't you got anything ready? I wasn't expecting you, Bob. Won't take me a minute, though. You sit down there. I'll go out and get a snack together for you. 
Can I fix you a sandwich, officer? A cup of coffee? No, thank you. No, thanks very much. Won't be a minute, Bob. We were just talking about you when you came in. What's it about, Sergeant? You want to see me or you just want to talk to my mother? As long as you're here, we'd like to talk to both of you, Bob. I got to take off pretty fast. Just came home to get something to eat. What's it about? It's about Geronimo. That's the gang's code word for the war you're setting up, isn't it? I don't know what you're talking about. Your gang, Bob, the Apaches. We talked to half a dozen of them last night down at the juvenile division. Is that right? Now, look, son, we've got the names of everybody in your gang. We know the whole setup. You go ahead with your idea, and you're going to buy a lot of trouble. A couple of cops were here last week. They said the same thing. I don't know any more about it now than I did then. Honest, what's the pitch anyway? You know what the pitch is, youngster. I don't, honest. You're trying to say I'm in a gang, is that it? You're in it up to your neck, son. Now, why don't you come off it? We've got you pegged and everybody that runs with you. That includes the girlfriends you got in the gang. You're not fooling anybody. You must be a little crazy. I'm not in any gang. I never even heard of one around here. Now, you listen to me, boy. You can take this as a warning or a piece of advice, either way. You and your friends keep on playing punk gangsters and we're going to lean on you. You understand? What is this? Trying to scare me? If it'll make you change your mind, yeah. If this street war comes off, there's going to be big trouble. What do you think's going to happen when 200 kids tangle in a fight with knives and brass knuckles? Now, use your head. Here you are, Bob. Nice milk, nice bowl of hot soup. Bacon and tomato sandwiches. <laughs> you, you always make the soup too hot. Oh, I didn't mean to. Let it cool off for a minute, then. Bob has to eat and hurry along, officers. Is there anything else you wanted to talk to him about? No, I think you've heard everything we have to say. I wish you'd think it over, Mrs. Lawson. You too, Bob. Nothing to think over. They're trying to say I'm in a gang. They think I'm the leader. You told them, didn't you, son? Sure. They don't believe me. I wish I could make you understand, Sergeant. He's not a gang leader. Robert's telling the truth. I'm afraid he isn't, ma'am. Well, he is. I know he is. I mean, after all, he's my son. I'm in a position to know him better than you do. Yes, ma'am. If he was lying, I'd know it. I wish I could make you understand. Mother is the only one who really knows her boy. I know Robert's telling the truth. Aren't you, Robert? Robert? Uh Uh-huh. That's so, isn't it? You're telling the truth, aren't you? Sure. How about some more soup? Before we left the house, we tried again to talk to Robert Lawson and his mother, but it was no use. She believed every word he said, and he apparently refused to believe the possible consequences of the war he was planning for his gang of juveniles. We drove downtown and had an interview with the boy's father at his work. He was even less cooperative. He took on a belligerent attitude, accused us of persecuting his son, and ordered us out of the office. Along with Sergeant Bill Gardner and Frank Kerber... We spent the rest of the afternoon and most of the following day checking with parents of youngsters who had been recently recruited into one of the various East Side gangs. Most of them were cooperative. Late that afternoon, Bill Gardner, Ed, and myself met with Captain Stein back at Hollenbeck Juvenile. Strict curfew all over the area. We can start tonight. What do you figure, just on the weekends? Every night, Sunday to Sunday. I'll get some more men in to help out. Every youngster out in the street after 10 o'clock gets stopped. Mm Mm-hmm. Every one of them caught with knives, saps, brass knuckles, or anything like them, they're going to be pulled in and filed on. No exceptions. Be a lot safer in custody than mixing in the gang fight. Well, it ought to help. Might teach some of the parents a lesson anyway. Huh? Yeah. Excuse me. Did you know the vision, Stein? Where was that? When? Uh huh, yeah, right away. Let's hustle at Evergreen Avenue out near the cemetery. Yeah, what is it? Curfew was a good idea. We got it too late. Huh? Gang war, it's already started. <laughs> Before we left the office, we had communications notify all J cars on the special detail to proceed at once to the scene of the major 415 call. Ten cars were ordered to cruise the area surrounding the actual scene of the fight and to pick up any and all members of the juvenile gangs who showed any evidence of having been in the fight or had in their possession any deadly weapon. Captain Stein, Bill Gardner, Ed, and myself left the office on a code three and drove out to the scene of the gang fight. When we got there, all the J cars and three radio crews had the area blocked off. An ambulance crew was treating more than a dozen youngsters who had been injured during the fight. One of the youngsters had a lacerated eye. He'd been blinded. Most of the other victims would carry scars for the rest of their lives. The juveniles who'd taken part in the battle and who'd been lucky enough to escape without serious injury were being loaded into the J cars and the radio cars. They were to be removed to juvenile headquarters at 1335 Georgia Street for further investigation. 
Together with Bill Gardner and Frank Kerber, Ed and I began covering the area, collecting dozens of homemade weapons used in the gang fight. They'd be turned over to Pete Brown, Hollenbeck Juvenile, to be booked as evidence. Joe? Yeah, Ed. Come here a minute. Over here. Yeah. Have a look. Piece of chain, bloodstains on it. Lousy how this is gonna get it. Come on. All right. Across the street there, the car in the driveway. Oh, yeah. Help him, he's hurt. Somebody help him, Bobby. What's the trouble? Bobby, he was in the fight. One of the gang, they stabbed him. He's in the car. Come on. What is it, Joe? Take a look. The Lawson boy, huh? Yeah, knife in his chest. Want me to get the doctor? Yeah, call the coroner, too. Listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Fatima, America's first largest selling blended cigarette, now king size. See the difference, taste the difference, smoke the difference. And in Fatima, the difference is quality. Yes, you get all the advantages of extra length plus Fatima quality, which no other king size cigarette has. That's why, week in, week out, year after year, more smokers are switching to Fatima's. 1950. Fatima sales higher than ever before in Fatima history. 1951. Another record year. Fatima sales up and up. Why, in one month alone, Fatima sales up 110% coast to coast. Friends, in the first months of 1952, to show our confidence in Fatima, we are making a special money-back guarantee to every king-size cigarette smoker. Buy a pack of Fatimas. Enjoy Fatima quality, extra mildness, and superbly blended tobaccos. If you're not convinced Fatima is better than the king-size cigarette you're now smoking, just return the pack and the unsmoked Fatimas before April 1st, and we'll give you your money back plus postage. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Remember, each king-size Fatima gives you a long, extra mild and soothing smoke with the added protection of Fatima quality. Buy Fatima. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Thursday, October 16th, 5.35 p.m. After the discovery of Robert Lawson's body in the car parked in the driveway adjoining the cemetery grounds, Ed brought the doctor over from the ambulance. The 17-year-old Lawson boy was pronounced dead. The doctor made out the prescribed form and marked it DOA. While we waited for the crime lab crew and the coroner to get there, Ed and I questioned the girl who'd led us to the body. She identified herself as Ann Porter, age 16. She told us she was Bob Lawson's girlfriend. She readily admitted accompanying him to the scene of the gang fight that afternoon. I knew what it was going to be like. I knew right then. I came closer. Bob told the kids to get ready. They were a little ways from us when they stopped. The other gang, the Purple Hearts. Yeah, go ahead. Please. There's a kid by the name of Jumpy. He's the leader. He stepped out in front of them and called to Bob. Called him a bad name, said bad things. This boy you called Jumpy, you know his real name, Ann? No, Jumpy's only his nickname. I know him when I see him, though. I can point him out. Well, what happened after he called Bob? I don't know. What? I don't know. I'm not sure. Everything seemed to happen at once. Bob swore at me, pushed me back, told me to get out of the way. Then he walked up to this kid, Jumpy, right in front of their whole gang. I screamed at Bob. I screamed at him not to. Why'd you scream? What'd he do? He had a chain under his coat. It was kind of a short whip-like. Bob had it doubled up. Yeah. When he went up to Jumpy, Bob had a cigarette in his mouth. He told Jumpy to light it for him. It's supposed to mean he's chicken if he does it. Jumpy laughed at him. Bob took out the chain, hit him across the face with it. Hit him with all his might. Mm -hmm. It knocked Jumpy down. He was laying on the sidewalk. His face was cut bad. Bob had the chain, kept hitting him with it. And somebody gave a yell, and both the gangs started fighting. Were you close to Bob Lawson most of the time? No, not first. There was a lot of yelling and kicking and fighting going on. I ran around and was looking for him, finally saw Bob. I'm not sure it happened so fast. What happened then? I'm not sure. I thought I saw Jumpy pull a knife on Bob. Long and thin, maybe an ice pick. Yeah. Bobby was still hitting him with the chain. It looked like Jumpy hit Bob in the chest with something right over the heart. 
Bobby stopped. Jumpy did it again. Bobby got white. He looked sick. He turned around and started to run. Well, what happened then? Bobby kept running. I knew he was hurt. I went after him. I saw him fall, but he got up. He kept running. Then one of the other gang grabbed me. They hit me. It's all right. We understand. I didn't find Bob until the fight was over. I heard the cops' cars coming, sirens. Coming around from everywhere. I felt sick. I finally found Bob, though. He was laying in the back seat of the car, just laying there. And that's when you called out? Yes. I guess I knew it. As soon as I looked at him, dead white as a sheet of Amy, see? Not when you find somebody dead, not somebody you love. All right, youngster. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. You're lying. You know that. It won't be all right. Take it easy, Ann. I love Bob. Didn't you know that? When he graduated, the first thing we were going to get married... As soon as he got out of school, we'd be married. We'd be married. Ann? Ann? Yeah. How old are you? I'm 16. Why? Nothing. It happens to practically everybody. What? People seem to make a lot of mistakes when they're 16. p.m. The crime lab crew arrived, took pictures of the entire scene along with all physical evidence and dusted the murder weapon an eight-inch knife for fingerprints. The coroner arrived, and after we'd completed our investigation, he removed the body to the county morgue. Along with a policewoman, we took Robert Lawson's girlfriend, 16-year-old Ann Porter, down to Georgia Street Juvenile Division to the assembly room. There, a special show-up was held of all the boys involved in the afternoon's fight. The Porter girl identified a 17-year-old by the name of Warren Stone, nicknamed Jumpy, as the boy who'd stabbed Robert Lawson to death. At least a dozen other subjects in the case identified the boy by his nickname, Jumpy. Three members of either gang involved in the fight declared in sworn statements that Warren Stone was the boy who'd attacked the Lawson boy with a homemade knife. Statements were taken from all concerned, and the ringleaders of the gangs were detained. The other subjects were released to their parents' custody after being notified that they would be filed on and a hearing held in juvenile court. Ann Porter was returned home by a policewoman. 7.55 p.m., Ed Jacobs and I took the subject, Warren Stone, to the captain's office where we tried to question him about the murder. He refused to say anything. I told you the truth. I told you the whole story. I don't have to tell you again. We're pretty sure you didn't tell us the truth, Warren. We know you tangled with Bob Lawson in that fight this afternoon. No, I didn't. We've got statements from a dozen kids, son. They say Lawson had a piece of chain. He kept slugging you with it. They say you pulled a knife and stabbed him. How do they know? A lot of kids there had knives. Anybody could have stabbed him. Why are you picking on me? It was your knife. It was your knife that killed him. Your initials on it. I lost a knife in the fight. Somebody could have picked it up, used it. No, that won't do, youngster. The handle of the knife's been processed. Your fingerprints are all over it. How about it, son? Warren? Come on now, what do you got to say? Nothing. I killed him. 8.40 p.m. Warren Stone was booked in at Georgia Street Jail on suspicion of 187 P.C., murder. Ed and I got in the car and drove out to the home of the murder victim to notify his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Lawson. Mr. Lawson wasn't home from work yet. We broke the news of her son's death to Mrs. Lawson as gently as we could. She became hysterical, and we called the family doctor who gave her sedatives. Later, when she recovered herself a bit, she asked for the full story. We told her. How could it happen? Bobby, how could it happen? Sorry, ma'am, there's not much we can say. We tried everything we could to stop it. But you didn't stop it. You let them kill Bobby. You let them kill him. No, ma'am. We tried to warn him. We tried to warn all of them. We're sorry. You're not sorry. You didn't try. Bob's dead. Everything I had. He's 17 years old and he's dead. I can thank you for that. My only baby. We're sorry you feel that way, Mrs. Lawson. Why shouldn't I feel that way? You call yourselves policemen. That boy who killed Bobby. You should have had him in jail in the first place. Young killer. Running around loose here as guilty as he is. I'm not defending him, ma'am, but he wasn't a young killer. Didn't even have a juvenile record. I don't care anything about records. He's a killer. He took a knife and he killed Bob, and you let him do it. You let him. I think we better be going in. Yeah. 
You or your husband will have to identify the body. When tomorrow morning will be all right, the county morgue. Dear God. You'll have to be at the coroner's inquest, too. You'll be notified about the time and the date. I hope you have to live with this. I hope you live with it like I have to live with it. I hope it drives you crazy. I know how you feel, ma'am, but you're wrong. I think you'll realize that. They murdered Bob. You let them kill him. I'll always remember that. All right. And you remember something else. The last time we came here to your house, we tried to make you understand. You didn't know Bobby. You didn't understand him. I was the only one. I always knew what he was thinking, what he wanted, what he was going to do. I was the only one. No, ma'am. There was somebody else. What? The boy who killed him. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 7th, the hearing was held in Juvenile Court, Department 38, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that hearing. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, just as a hobby, I've been collecting early jazz records, blues and two-beat music like Leon Bix Beiderbeck used to play, and of course, just about everything Benny Goodman has done. I've always tried to build my collection on quality. Now, in my opinion, that's the only rule to follow in choosing a king-size cigarette. Choose for quality. Believe me, I know that's what you'll find in Fatima. I know because I smoke them. If you haven't, here's what I'd like you to do. Get a pack tomorrow and compare them. When you see the difference, taste the difference, and then smoke that difference, I'm convinced that you'll switch to Fatima. Because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Each king-size Fatima gives you a long, extra mild and soothing smoke with the added protection of Fatima quality. Next time, buy Fatima. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. <laughs> Seventeen-year-old Warren Ernest Stone was filed on alleging violation of 187 P.C. murder. The rest of the juvenile gang ringleaders were filed on alleging 242 P.C. battery. They were all made wards of the juvenile court and placed in detention homes under the supervision of the state youth authority. They are still confined in state institutions for juveniles. <laughs> just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Heard tonight were Barney Phillips, Charles Smith, and Eddie Firestone. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Fatima Cigarettes. Best of all king-size cigarettes has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Next, it's David Harding and Counter Spy on NBC.